اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم رب شرح لی صدری و یسر لی عمری وحل العقدہ جن من لسانی یفقہو قولی We start with Surah Yunus today. Surah Yunus is a Makki Surah and it has 109 verses and 10 rukus. Its name is on the name of Prophet Yunus a.s. He is also known as Zunnun which means the one with the fish because he had been swallowed by a fish and another name given to him in the Quran is Sahib al-Hut which also means the one with the fish now this surah is named after him because his story has been revealed in this surah the basic themes of this surah are number 1 oneness of Allah number 2 mission of his messengers and number 3 inevitability of the hereafter Verse one, Alif, Lam, Ra. These are the verses of the Book of Wisdom. Now, Alif, Lam, Ra. These are harufe mukattaat, and commentators have given many interpretations of these uh, cut words. These are cut words, but according to the authentic verdict of the Sahabas and the Tabeen, these are secret symbols or signs, and it is likely that. Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam maybe he knew their meaning but he elected to disclose uh, to his community only those areas of knowledge and insight which their minds could bear by and nothing that muslims must do is dependent upon knowing the secrets of such isolated letters nor do they have to miss anything by not knowing them i mean that it's not important for them to in any way to know the meaning of these words therefore prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam too did not tell his community about their meaning as being unnecessary for them therefore we too should not go about digging into it because it is certain that had the knowing of their meaning been necessary for us our master who was mercy personified for the whole world would never have uh, hesitated in telling us about it now the verse says tilka ayatul kitabil hakim the word hakim has several meanings one meaning of hakim is muhkam which means strong meaning that this book is strong in defining halal and haram uh the limits and instructions then another meaning of hakim is that it decides meaning that when there is a conflict between people it acts as a judge by deciding and hakim also means wise why is this statement made about the quran because as we know that this is a makki surah and we know that there were many allegations laid on prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam during this period that he is a magician or a madman nauzubillah and this book is a part of his magic and it is uh, composed of magical poetry which bewitches people now this confusion is actually being answered that this book is neither poetry nor magic but what ayatul kitabil hakim these words of wisdom and poetry uh, which you call uh, th- these are the words of wisdom which you call poetry and magic they are from uh, the being who is most wise and the one who is deprived from listening and comprehending this book is in fact deprived of all these benefits which this book carries was to does it seem strange to the people that we revealed our will to a man from among themselves saying one mankind and give the good news to the believers that they are on sound footing with their rab the disbeliever says this man is indeed an obvious magician Now the people of Makkah out of their ignorance somehow they uh, decided or they assumed that a messenger or a prophet who comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala should not be a human being. 
instead he should be an angel and the verse says that why do you find it so strange that this book is revealed on a human being out of all the options choosing a human being for the revelation of this book was the best option had it been revealed on an angel or a jinn then people would have had difficulty in following them how can one creation with its limited powers follow another creation which has its own limits and differences of power then the verse says that warn such people with it and also give glad tidings of what kadama sidkin now kadama sidkin has been given three meanings it means number 1 high ranks of janna number 2 beautiful reward and number 3 righteous deeds which a momen sends ahead and the people who believe in this book will achieve the station of truth verse 3 the fact is that your rab is the same allah who created the heavens and the earth in 6 days and then established himself on the throne in a manner that suits his majesty and is directing the affairs of the universe none can intercede for you except the one who receives his permission this is allah your rab so worship him will you not receive admonition now this verse is actually an introduction of allah subhanahu wa taala now who is he subhanahu wa taala number 1 as the verse says allazi khalaqa samawati wal arda one who created everything number 2 yudabbiru al amr one who regulates all matters and number 3 ma min shafiin illa mim ba'di iznihi this is being said and there is so much or that no one dares to speak in front of him or intercede unless he allows it himself and this is the same concept which was presented in the ayatul kursi where it says manzal lazi yashfa indahu illa bi iznihi who can intercede with him without his permission and what do we have to do fa'buduhu worship him we have to live obeying his commands the verse asks that seeing all these facts all these signs of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will you not come back to your senses will you still not believe will you still not obey will your deeds still not change and if there is a person who recognizes his rab and a person who does not then can the two of them remain equal verse 4 to him you shall all return allah's promise is true he is the one who originates the process of creation and repeat it so that he may justly reward those who believed in him and did righteous deeds as for those who disbelieved they shall have boiling fluids to drink and shall undergo a painful punishment because they rejected the truth now the verse says that don't forget that eventually you have to come back to him subhanahu wa ta'ala and this promise of allah is true and what is the proof of the truth of this promise that if allah can create you once he has all the power to create you a second time even now or days there are people who say that how can it be that a body decomposes and then it will be formed again back to its shape so such people are answered that allah has demonstrated this miracle of creation 
in front of your very eyes then why would he be unable to perform this miracle again and this verse also answers another important question that what is the point behind raising all human beings again the answer is so that allah subhanahu wa taala recompenses them for their good or bad deeds now people have such shallow minds that when it comes to dunya a demonstration becomes a proof they like a painting they find out who the artist is and they they will get one painted for themselves by him with the surety that he can definitely make it for them to again they like the design of a house they will look for the same architect and get their house designed the same way with the surety that he will make no error they like a suit that has been beautifully designed and stitched they will look for the same designer and get their clothes made because they are so confident that their dress will be like the one they liked in fact in everything in every product the sample or the demonstration is the convincing factor or the proof so why then they doubt the power of allah subhanahu wa taala when they see this miracle of creation being repeated countless times since billions and trillions of years right now in front of their very eyes as to the point that why did allah subhanahu wa taala had to create the next world or the akhira and why wouldn't people just be born and you know live and then die again because this dunya was not designed aimlessly it was designed with a purpose and a complete plan and the akhira is a vital and crucial part of this plan the plan is that this dunya is darul amal the place to work for and the akhira is the darul jaza the place for recompense so divine will and divine plan has to be manifested and anyways no one can be rewarded or punished to the full in this dunya as it is too short lived if there was no akhira then what was the test all about where everyone had to end up the same way verse 5 He is the one who gave the sun its brightness and the moon its light established her phases that you may learn to compute the years and other such counts Allah created them only to manifest the truth he has spelled out his revelations for people who want to understand now the introduction of Allah subhanahu wa taala carries on and uh, it is said that allah is he who made the sun and the word zia an used with the sun in arabic the word zia is used for that object which enlightens other objects the one that shines itself and makes other shine also and this meaning fits so accurately with the sun we see that the sun rays fall on anything even a small dust particle and it starts shining then the verse says that allah created the moon then allah says uh in the verse qaddaruhu meaning that allah subhanahu wa taala determined mayyad stages for it and manzil or manazil mean that distance which they cover in one night and one day with their movement now these days are 28 or 29 and then it hides and then shows up as a new hilal the reason behind this is so that we can keep count of years and other matters and the first purpose of these objects was giving light and the second purpose of creating the sun and the moon is that you can keep count of time in the form of years and months and to keep track of hajj and ramazan and the sacred months the verse invites us to think that these two objects the sun and moon are working with such 
mathematical accuracy how can they work just on their own if this power of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not regulating them and then the verse says ma khalaqa allah zalika illa bil haqq meaning that allah has not created these things aimlessly but they have a purpose behind it it's not just eat drink and be merry for tomorrow you will die and we have to fulfill the purpose for which we have been created and the end of the verse says that these signs can be understood better by people who have knowledge what knowledge knowledge of the mysteries of this world and knowledge of the quran verse 6 indeed in the alteration of the night and the day and what allah has created in the heavens and the earth there are signs for those who are allah fearing now the verse says that this contrast of the day and night and then the contrast of everything in this universe is a great sign uh, for the people of taqwa now what do people of taqwa understand from this alteration that righteousness and, and evilness are two different paths and they have two different ends and if they would take the path of error then they cannot reach jannah this is a simple and a short verse but it carries a notion of meaning if you go deeper into its meaning it makes the inevitability of the akhira certain and absolute on the ponderer how now as you know that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is introducing himself in this surah and for this purpose he is mentioning a few of his creations and inviting man to ponder over them and if he ponders and reflects upon them with a sincere heart getting to know allah and finding allah and then it remains no mystery now if you reflect upon this system of day and night what facts do we see firstly that the objects that are used in this program are always there they suffer no loss no wear and tear they are moving and functioning in a manner that is precise and uninterrupted since billions of years which shows clearly that some being is taken care is taking care of it and also commanding it to function in that way regulating it to function in that way and then this whole system is so calculated so amazingly immaculate accurate meticulous that the human beings can predict beforehand that the sun will rise on this time and set at this time so what does this all convey to us about its creator that he is a very wise being whose unfathomable wisdom is beyond question so the crux of the matter is that can it be expected that this wise being has created this world without a purpose just for one and one day he will wind up everything when he gets bored no all this is for a purpose and a plan and a vital and most important clause of that plan is the hereafter the akhirah and if he can bring the day after the night and the night after the day he can surely bring death after life and life after death and after <clears throat> visualizing with your own eyes the manifestations of his wisdom how can you expect that he will not call man to account after granting him common sense moral feelings independent responsibility <clears throat> and the authority to exploit his endless resources and that he will not reward those who make the right use of these and punish those who abuse them <clears throat> verse 7 as for those who do not hope to meet 
meet us on the day of judgment. Being well pleased and satisfied with this worldly life and those who give no heed to our revelations. Now we see that in the previous few verses, manifestation of Allah's power in the universe were mentioned. Now, despite such open signs and evidences uh, spreading out in this universe, human beings split up into two groups. One of the group just paid no heed to these divine signs and failed to recognize their creator and failed to recognize themselves as well. When you don't recognize your creator, you don't recognize yourself. It never occurred to them that they were no animal like other animals. And they never discovered that their mighty Lord had blessed them with intelligence reason, common sense, in a degree much higher than that of the animals. Their Lord had put the entire resources of divine creation at their doorstep. Everything was there to serve them. This should have made them realize that there has to be something their Lord wants them to do some duty or obligation and that they would have to account for whatever they had been asked to do and for this it would be necessary that there should be a fixed day the day of ultimate reckoning and recompense the day of kayama but unfortunately did these people did nothing of the sort instead they preferred to live their lives at the level of common animals such people do not think that they will meet their Lord. They have forgotten about the life of the hereafter and have become pleased and content with their worldly life. Then they are sitting there so satisfied and so content as if they just do not have to go anywhere else from here. And this was where they have to live forever. It never occurs to them that everyone has to bid farewell to this world. They never bother that some preparations have to be made for the place one is going to. And it all started with one basic drawback and that is being heedless to the signs of Allah. Had they pondered over the marvel of the heavens and the earth and what was created in between them and over what was in their own person, they would have understood the reality behind everything and they would have come out of this fatal and deadly negligence. The worst Actually, this verse is the theme of the surah. These people never seek spiritual heights and they are heedless of Allah's signs also that they are not interested in reading the Quran. They are not interested in hearing or studying the Quran in depth. And it is so unfortunate that a majority of the Muslim ummah is in that state. Where are all our energy is going, that we have nice houses, nice cars, good careers, posts, ranks, well-established children, and that's all. We are quite content with it. And to think of it, is that really all? What about a house in Jannah? What about all those blessings which are promised to the people of Jannah? And what about our children? Do we ever think that our negligence to their religious and spiritual education can lead them to be thrown into the fires of hell? Have we ever thought that these houses which we are busy decorating and polishing all the time will remain here? For them, we neglect Allah and eventually we would be going to Allah, leaving these houses and finding a place maybe in a pit of hell due to this negligence. As the next verse says, verse 8, <clears throat> they shall have the fire as their abode because of what they had earned. Verse 9, in fact, those who believe in the truth which is revealed in this book and do good deeds, their Rabb will guide them because of their faith 
and rivers will flow beneath their feet in the gardens of bliss. In this verse, those fortunate people who pondered over the signs of the most exalted Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, are mentioned. This is the second group of people and after this they recognized him, believed him, in him acted in accordance with his commands in other words they did amal saleh and the good return these wonderful people will get is jannah where rivers shall be flowing in the gardens of bliss verse 10 <clears throat> glory to you o allah their greetings therein will be peace be upon you and their closing remarks will be all praises are for allah alone the rub of the worlds now this verse shows us a scene about some particular states in which the people of jannah will be when they enter jannah Number one, da'wahum fiha subhanakallahumma. Their prayer therein will be, pure are you, O Allah. The words da'wa mean a claim, but here it is not used in that sense. Here it means that they would be glorifying the exalted majesty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which we call be in our religious terminology so these people would be saying like their breath goes in and out subhanaka allahumma and then number two watahiyatuhum fiha salam their greetings therein will be salam that one would be hearing salam salam everywhere and uh, where would this salam be coming from or from whom would it be coming from? Salam from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the people of Jannah. Then the salam of the angels to them. Then their own salam between themselves. So this salam would be a very prominent and ev evident feature everywhere. And number three, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Praise be to Allah, Lord of the worlds. According to Tafsiru Almani, it says that the natural order of these three states is that when the people of Jannah will say Subhanaka Allahumma in response to which they will receive the greetings of Salam from Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala and as a result they will say Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. It says in a hadith Qudsi, if you find any goodness within yourself, then praise Allah and thank Allah. Why? Because the merit belongs to Allah and not to you. Verse 11, if uh, Allah were to hasten the punishment for the evil, as they hasten in asking good of this world, then the respite given to the people would have been terminated. But this is not our way we leave those people alone who do not entertain the hope of meeting us to blunder about in their rebellion now the verse talks about people who ask allah for shar what is shar which is not good for them for example if allah has given someone a healthy life and due to some problem he says that allah give me death or if allah has blessed someone with children and sometimes all ch children create problems and one starts saying that Allah, it would have been better if I was without such children. Or if a woman is angry at her husband, he starts praying that Allah separate me from him. The verse says that if Allah has uh, started listening, if Allah had started listening to such pleas, then the whole world would have come to an end. Another example of this is that people used to say to almost every prophet that if you are truthful, then bring the azab you are talking about. Now the gist of the verse is that just as people pray for khair, that is good and Allah accepts their duas instantly. But when people make bad dua due to problems and ask for negative things for themselves or their children, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his infinitive mercy ignores such Badduas, such curses. And Prophet ﷺ once said, the gist of which is that never give badwa to yourself, your children or your business. Maybe you are doing it on such a moment that it is the moment of acceptance. Allah says that granting them azab they are asking for is not in my control. It's not 
my way i leave this uh, sorry uh, prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam says that this azab is not in my control it is only in allah's control and allah's way is that he leaves these people in their rebellion and what is their rebellion this ungratefulness to allah their punishment in dunya is that they wander in their rebellion and ungratefulness all their lives and this attitude makes them all the more qualified for hell this is allah's way of punishing them that they chose this way this erroneous way of um, ingratitude and uh, forgetting the akhirah then allah lets them grow up in this way not giving them uh, hidayah because they are not asking for hidayah verse 12 whenever affliction touches a man he prays to us whether lying down on his side sitting or standing but as soon as we relieve his affliction he walks away as if he had never prayed to us for removing that affliction which touched him thus the foul deeds which they do are made fair seeming to the transgressors now human nature is exposed in this verse and this is the case with all of us each one of us that when everything is going smooth and easy we pray quickly make our duas mechanically fold our prayer mat and run and when we are in a fix then things are different we cry before allah we beg him with our heart and we are praying for this problem of ours every moment sitting standing even lying then allah subhanahu wa taala out of his extreme mercy removes this problem then after some days we forget about it we become disconnected and indifferent to allah as if we had never called him and he had never helped now why do people do this because they have so many interests and so many preoccupations the verse says that such people are musrifin those who exceed and the word musrifin here means that these people do not have a balanced approach in life one moment they are crying before allah and the rest of the days they forget allah as if he was not there but the case of a mu'min is different he remembers allah all the same whether good times or bad times the end of the verse says that their deeds seem fair to them now how do deeds seem fair number 1 that it becomes an azmaish that one openly and proudly uh brags about one's sins and bad behavior what we call chori and sina zori in our language number 2 it is a waswasa of shaitan that he beautifies these deeds for them and number 3 nafs meaning that sometimes your nafs prompts you to evil now the point to be understood is that if we apply this verse on our own selves that obviously when one is in a fix and you have nothing other than the mercy of allah to rely on you implore allah more okay that is absolutely fine but the problem is when we totally forget these times in the first place we don't thank allah enough and secondly we forget about them whereas the correct approach is that they should consciously be remembered on and off and allah subhanahu wa taala should be thanked again and again and this will not only nourish and boost our iman but increase our obedience to our reliance on allah will become strong and we will become a better person thereof verse 13 we have destroyed generations before your time when they adopted unjust attitudes their rasuls came to them with clear signs but they would not believe thus do we recompense criminals now the word qurun is the plural of karan which means people of one era or one generation and the verse means that no one should miscalculate that punishment cannot come in this world just because allah subhanahu wa taala gives 
respite to those who deny and disbelieve. The history of the past people shows that different kinds of punishments have visited them because of their disobedience. And why did Allah punish those past nations? Because they did zulm. And if you do this zulm, then this can happen to you as well. Now the word zulm here covers all sorts of sins that are committed when people transgress the bounds of Allah's slavery. Verse 14, Then we made you their successor in the land, so that we may observe how you would conduct yourself. Verse 15, When our clear revelations are recited to them, those who entertain no hope of meeting us say, You bring us a Quran different than this or make some changes in it. O Muhammad, tell them, It is not possible for me to change it myself. I follow only what is revealed to me. Indeed, I cannot disobey my Rabb, for I fear the punishment of a mighty day. Now, the people who do not believe in the Akhira. Their response on listening to the Quran is that it is heavy on their hearts. And they say that change it or bring something else. Even today we have such things that people say that this part of the Quran is not practical. So it has to be changed according to our own times. As if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't know now Zubillah that this time would come and it would be practical or not practical. Actually, when this verse was revealed, there were people who did not know much about Allah or revelations or prophets sent by him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. They took them to be like common human beings, having nothing special about them. And they thought that the Quran was spoken and written by Prophet wasallam, And it was under this uh, frame of mind that they told the Prophet wasallam. they said, as for this Quran, it is against our beliefs and uh, our ideologies. And these idols our forefathers have been worshipping since ever as providers of our needs. According to the Quran, totally false and ineffectual type of uh, arguments were presented by them. And there are things... We have been, they used to say that there are things we have been using and transactions we have been making all along. The Quran says that they are all unlawful. The Quran is totally contradicting all our beliefs and all our actions. And then the Quran tells us that we have to live again after we are dead and that we have to account for everything we have done and all these things make no sense to us at all. We are not ready to accept them. Therefore, you do one of the two things we are asking you to do. Either you replace this one with another Quran, which does not have these uh, things, these points which we have raised, just omit them or at least amend this very Quran and uh, omit those undesirable things from here. And actually, the deen they desired was something that suited their interests, their desires. They were not ready for a change. They were not uh, ready to give up their uh, ways. So they thought that with mutual consent, they should evolve a new structure of deen, a deen that would accommodate and accept all their weaknesses and erroneous ways and they would uh, accept from that deen whatever suits and benefits them. So this deen would be, in other words, a blend of tawheed and shirk, a blend of good and evil, a blend of right and wrong. And this deen would act as a compromise between Islam and Kufr. Now, rejecting their false notions first, the Quran instructs Prophet ﷺ to tell those people that the Quran was not his word, first of all. Nor does he have the authority or capability to change it on his own. 
he only followed what was revealed to him by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If he were to make the least change in it on his own and by his choice, he would be committing a grave sin and he feared the punishment that falls upon those who disobey Allah. Therefore, he could not do that. The last sentence at the end of the verse, which says, I cannot disobey my Rabb, for I fear the punishment of a mighty day. Now, this is really, really important. Imagine if Prophet wasallam, who is the purest of the pure, if he is saying this, then what about people like us? How can we dare to go about disobeying Allah whenever we want to? And the message of the verse is that this deen is complete. It is practical. It is moderate as well as decisive. There is no room for apologies and compromises in this deen. And anyone who wants to follow it can do it as it is. Otherwise, the people who find faults in it, they are free to leave and they are free to reject it. Verse 16, say, if Allah wanted otherwise, I would not have made you aware of it. Then I have lived among you for years before it. Have you then no sense? Then Prophet ﷺ was asked to tell them that he did everything under divine orders. Had it been the will of Allah Ta'ala that this word should not be recited to them, neither would he have recited that to them, nor would he have let them know about that. Now that it was the very will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that they should be made to listen to precisely that word, who can dare make any addition or delete something which is there? After the fact that the Quran was from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and it was his word, an open argument is given. It says, then I have lived among you for years before it. This means that just think for a moment, is it not that much before the revelation of the Quran, I have spent a long period of 40 years of my life among you. During this period, you have never heard me composing and reciting poetry or writing essays in prose. Had I been uh, proficient in saying something like this word of Allah, I would have naturally said at least some of it during the period of 40 years. In addition to that, you have a direct experience of my character and conduct, particularly of my truth and honesty. During these long 40 years of my life among you, you know that I have never lied. Then why would I start lying suddenly now? After all those 40 years, this clearly proves that Prophet ﷺ is true and trustworthy. Whatever there is in the Quran is the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and has come from him. Now this verse is quoted as the proof of authenticity of the Quran. You see that Mecca was not a big city. It was a small city where everyone knew everyone. And Prophet ﷺ was especially prominent due to certain reasons. For example, the incident of Halful Fuzul, uh, the incident of the fixing of the stone of Kaaba, then his contribution in social work, then belonging to an influential family, his excellent ikhlaq, and then being famous as Sadiq and Amin. And suddenly he has started producing such words of eloquence. And he does not go to a madrasa or a library. All these things point out that this was nothing else but a revelation from Allah, Wahiyye Ilahi. 
Verse 17 say, Who can be more unjust than the one who himself forges a lie, then ascribes it to Allah or falsifies his real revelations? Now this verse concludes the subject and warns that attributing any statement of Allah Ta'ala that was not his word or denying what actually was were crimes deserving severe punishment and another point is that the mission of prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was successful and this success proves the truthfulness of his mission and that he was not a criminal nauzubillah and these people portrayed him to be uh, an untruthful person or a criminal person verse 18 they worship other deities besides Allah who can neither harm them nor benefit them. And they say these are our intercessors with Allah. O Muhammad, say to them, you are informing Allah of what he knows to exist neither in the heavens nor on the earth. Glory to him. He is far above from having the partners they ascribe to him. Now one point has to be understood that... One aspect of ibadah is dua. And then we find in our society that educated people going to mazars, educated people praying to peers, praying to Hazrat, praying to Hazrat Ali, praying to Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allah says they worship besides Allah things that cannot harm them or profit them. What are we told? That Prophet ﷺ was told to tell people that I cannot even benefit or harm my own self. Illa masha Allah. Except as Allah wills. If he, if he could not benefit or harm his own self, then how can he benefit us? And the verse says that these people claim that they are our intercessors with Allah. Even now, if you ask these educated people that why are you going to mazars and praying there, they give the same answer that no, no, we are not praying to them directly, but we are asking them to pray for, uh, we are asking them to pray to Allah for us. And Allah says that do you inform Allah of that of which he did not know? Now, as we have already read, that such people cannot even help themselves. How can they ask help? And uh, how can they ask Allah for help for someone else? And the end of the verse says that Allah is far above from having the partners they ascribe to him. Verse 19. Man was once just one nation. Later on, they became divided. Though inventing different creeds, if your Rabb had not already given his word, the matters in which they differed would have certainly been decided. Now, the verse means that in the earlier stages of man's existence, all human beings were one nation. That is, they believed in Allah. And this time was from the time of Adam alayhi salam till the time of Noah alayhi salam. It was during this time that shirk and kufr popped up. And he was the first one to confront with it. And it is obvious that there was a long period of time between Adam and Noah alayhi salam. And human race had multiplied and spread all over the world. And it is... Uh, and it brought uh, different living styles and social lives and also differences of opinion. The verse says, if your Rabb had not already given his word, uh, the matters in which they differed would certainly have been uh, decided. Now, what is this word which Allah has given? It means that Allah had already decided that Allah will remain in disguise. He will be behind the veil and people will recognize him. 
uh, with his signs because if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was exposed directly then there would have been no difference of opinion for example if the sun had not risen people can give different opinions about the sun but if the sun rises with all its brightness then there would be no difference of opinion so this decision of Allah that he would test every human being otherwise he would have shown one glimpse of his self or made his voice heard and everyone would have believed and obeyed him